All right. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, we are now going to be looking at uh, study, study unit one. Um, so as we said in the previous class, um, between now until end of October, that's when we're going to be dedicating this time to go through the different study units, right? So which means that we're going to start, start with study unit one until we get to study unit 23. And um, if you're going to be using study guide from last year for those who are repeating, please be careful because over time, the lecturer is busy uh, streamlining on the study units, on the material that needs to be covered in the study units as well. So try to get the latest study unit as well. Then um, over time, we're going to be looking at the assignments as well. So we're going to be uh, we are going to be reviewing to see exactly how much detail needs to be covered in the assignment so that we know exactly uh, whether we need to set aside a class for the for the assignment or it's, if it's going to be one of those short questions so we can prepare a template for those assignments as well. Then uh, also uh, for those who are not yet registered. Uh, please take time to inquire regarding the articles as well, because uh, today well, we tried as much as possible to make the material available to, uh, to the students. Then uh, once you're registered, you'll be able to access the articles as well on our portal as well, because we already have the articles available for all the study units, and they are already highlighted with a bit of notes on them as well. So please take note of that. Um, so today we are going to be looking at study unit one, and uh, looking at study unit one, if you check in the study guide, when you look at study unit one, if you check in the study guide, uh, study unit one looks at lessons not learned. And uh, when you look at lessons not learned uh, for study unit one, they are basically looking at um, articles or case studies where you have uh, cases where there was uh, risk management failures as well, and they are giving you these different uh, article, uh, these different case studies for you to be able to understand exactly the background behind uh, risk management failures and exactly how they end up affecting the whole, the whole organization as well. So the main idea behind these articles is, is for you to be able to pick up exactly in practice uh, where were the risk management failures and how would you be able to remedy those uh, risk management failures in practice as well. And um, we are going to be looking at now after this. That's when you see that now from study unit two or study unit one or not, you are now going to be looking at the, uh, for study unit one, you're going to be looking at identifying the different risks and also whether they are going to be known risk or unknown, unknown risks. Then uh, at study unit, so between study unit one and study unit two, the main idea behind them is where we are basically saying that as an organization, you need to be able to be agile enough to be able to keep up with the ever-changing world. Because if you look at the way uh, technology is progressing as well, it's also affecting the environment in which what the organizations are working. And as we go going to the future as well, as the world is changing, we're discovering a lot of things. And in the process of discovery as well, you will see that there are so many other things that are also going to be uh, resulting in new risks, which are going to be um, coming from our environment or whichever, um, factors are going to be affecting the organization. So which means that at the end of the day, you need to make the whole idea behind study unit one and study unit two is that we are saying your organization need to be agile enough for you to be able to, to be adaptive so that when uh, the risk factors come in and affect your organization, how do you turn these risk factors into a competitive advantage so that you're able to, what, to keep up with the competition? Like for example, if you look at the, uh, the case of the pandemic, the companies that are able to that were able to survive during the worst period of the pandemic are companies that were innovative enough to actually come up with new ideas to say, yes, we've been offering this particular product, but how can we now tweak our offering so that we're able to actually what be able to keep up and survive and ride through this particular storm so that at the end of the day, when the pandemic is over, when the or when the conditions have eased, we can now be able to actually what continue uh, okay, uh, surviving. We can now be able to continue operating as an organization and hence what? Survival as well. So that we're able to ensure that going to the future, we can now go back to being what? Profitable as well. So uh, looking at this, if you look at study unit one, study unit one looks at 
Um, uh, risk management. And uh, remember, we said study unit one looks at lessons not learned. And if you look at study unit one, they give us different case studies, right? Now, when you look at these different case studies, we, I normally in assignments and also in uh, exams as well, the lecturer doesn't really uh, ask you about a particular case study to say uh, from this case study that you went through the articles, what did you learn or anything like that. That's not usually how they bring in those type of questions in the exam. They give you a case study, then based on that particular case study, they ask you questions, right? So which means if you look at, at um, um, unit 1.1, they give us the case study of ESCO, uh, examples of crisis experienced by what? By organizations. They give us the, the case study of ESCO. Then they, uh, unit 1.2, they give us the case study of um, uh, Bearings Bank, where the individual, uh, the um, trader by, or directional trader by the name of Nick Lisson also ended up having a situation where they are, uh, ended up bringing down the whole organization because it's low, he ended up what having a situation where he was covering for his losses because there was no checks and balances. Then he was basically found in both the front office and the back office. And because of that, he was able to try continue what, covering up for his losses as well. And because of this, the losses ended up compounding to such a situation where it ended up what uh, resulting in the um, bringing down or the collapse of the, uh, of the bank that has been running for a, uh, quite a long time as well. So this is, they look at the case of uh, Bearings Bank and you need to 1.3, they look at the case, uh, case of HIH, which is basically an insurance company, where you find that um, because of pressure to be uh, profitable, you see that the management and also the directors as well, they were uh, involved in cases where they were, um, they were covering up for the basically Sugar quoting the financial statements and the, uh, the performance of the organization, and they were overstating what the organization was basically uh, looking to, uh, to achieve going to the future as well, so that they are able to actually attract more and more investors as well. So you will see that on the case of HIH, it's basically another issue where there was uh, there was basically lack of control, controls, and what accountability within the organization as well. Then uh, unit uh, one point four. This is where you look at the case study of Com Air, where the the um a system that was what they used for scheduling um uh, flights or scheduling booking of flights as well, and they were busy. They were in the transition of um moving from one system going to another system as well. But either way, they realized that they didn't know that their system uh because of weather conditions they were uh, um they were clients or they were clients who had booked for flights that canceled and some of them so the some people who canceled and then they were trying to book other people as well and then the system they didn't know that the system actually had a limit on the number of booking and canceling that was supposed to be done in a particular month as well so because they didn't know there was there was a limit the system basically ended up crashing and there was a lot of chaos as well so that's basically where they look at the case study of com m so if you look at these case studies my advice would be go through them where you look at the lessons not, not learned. So you need to go through those particular case studies. Then after going through those particular case studies as well, you need to be able to know them uh, in practice. But historically, I, I don't think that it's going to be those sections where you would expect to be asked um, what in the either in the assignments or in the, uh, in the exam as well. Mainly because if they bring you questions in the assignment in the exam, they give you information on the case study, then based on the information of the case study, you answer the questions. So for you to be able to know now historically from a practical perspective, uh, what or what are they, uh, how, where do you basically identify or see cases where there was a risk and management failures within a particular organization as well, I'll ask you to go through these particular case studies. But I'll, my advice would be don't spend too much of your time on these case studies, because remember, at the end of the day, we're trying to make sure that you, uh, you, you uh, have enough information that you need for you to be able to pass the assignments and for you to be able to pass the exams as well. So we're not going to be spending too much time on material that we know that, yes, it's important material that you need to know from a practical perspective, but for you to be prepared for the exam, I don't expect to see this uh, case study to be something that would be brought in as something that would be examinable.
So go through unit 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4. In class, we're not going to go through them, but just go through these particular case studies so that you have a better understanding as well. Are there any questions uh, from unit 1.1 to 1.4? Are there any questions? All right. So today in class, we are going to look at unit 1.5 and unit 1.6. Now, when you look at unit 1.5, we look at risk management failures. What are they and when do they happen? Historically, the lecturer has never asked questions from study unit one. But, in, but you see that if you look at the trend of how the lecturer asks questions, over time, he does have some new material, new uh, study units that he also brings in or some new articles that he also brings in uh, to examine as well. So which means that for us to be prepared, it means that if we're going to be expecting to prepare ourselves for the exam, going into the future, probably they can bring, what we can expect them to bring in, instead of unit one, point, uh, unit one would be probably 1.5 and 1.6, right? Although these uh, sections have never been brought uh, in the past assignments or past exams before, we just need to know them so that we know that we're covered on those particular units as well. Because there are some material which might be examinable at some point. So unit 1.5 looks at um, risk management failures. What are they and when do they happen, right? And based on this, they ask us to look at the uh, this particular article as well, which is basically based on that particular heading as well. So looking at uh, this particular article, so how we go through different articles as well, because uh, how we go through different articles, we look at being able to address these self-assessment uh, questions as well. So if you're able to address the self-assessment questions, you are, it basically means that if the questions are going to be brought in the exam, most likely they're going to be bringing them or uh, asking questions based on the self-assessment um, questions as well. So here they say, argue the case that LTCM, uh, LCTM um, um, uh, demise uh, caused by a risk management failure and compare the roles and responsibilities of risk management and top executive management, discuss the types of risk management failures and discuss the alternatives that enterprises can consider to prepare for the future crisis as well. So what I would see is, um, uh, sections which are highly examinable is not necessarily to do with this case study of uh, uh, LT, uh, LCTM, but the uh, point, bullet point number two, three, and four, if ever the questions are going to, if the questions are going to be based on the unit 1.5, we can look out for bullet points two, three, and four, because it most likely uh, they are going to give you a particular case study, then based on that, they ask you questions so that you're able to now apply the knowledge that you have to be for you to be able to attempt the questions as well. So going to this uh, case study of uh, going to the case study. Um, So going to the start, uh, case study, on page um, on page two of uh, the article, so on page two of the article, which is page three of the PDF. So on page two of the article, on line number eight, they say this article does not examine the subprime financial crisis or problems of financial institutions during the crisis directly. Rather, it is an attempt to make sure that if risk management is blamed, it is for the right reasons. So here they say, uh, if you skip that, uh, the next sentence as well, they say, I therefore show when bad outcomes can be blamed on risk management and when they cannot. So in the process of doing so, I provided a typology of uh, risk management failures as well.
then just to have a background understanding of uh, the article, please put your microphones on mute. So just to have a background of, uh, of, uh, the, of the case study, although this material, I wouldn't expect it to be something that is examinable, but since we're used, going to use this material for us to now be able to understand the concepts which are covered after this case study, I'm just going to go through a brief background of exactly what was happening. So when you look at the case study of uh, LTCM, it's basically long-term capital management. So the company's name was Long-Term Capital Management, and it was founded in uh, 1994. And looking at this particular uh, company as well, it was really made up of um, people who had a very good background in financial management. And some of them are people who had come up with different theorems that are basically even used until today. Uh, for example, you look, if you still remember the, uh, the Black Scores Metal model, for those who are doing, who did um, uh, um, investment management, where you look at derivatives, uh, one of the models that was used there for pricing of um, calls and options, uh, calls, uh, call options and uh, put options, it was basically based on the Black Scores Metal model. So it was one of the parties were also part of the management of this particular company. So it was basically made up of people who really knew very well, uh, when it, who were very um, well informed when it comes to the financial management in our financial industry and also risk management industry as well. So here they say, before each collapse, I'm, look, I'm reading, going through the highlighted section. So before its collapse, LTCM had kept a close to 5 billion, uh, assets in excess of 100 billion, and derivatives for a notional amount excess of 1 trillion. So by mid-September, LTCM's capital had fallen by more than 3.5 billion and the Federal Reserve of New York coordinated a rescue by private financial institution that injected 3.65 billion in the fund. Does a loss of more than 70% of capital represent risk management failure? Does a loss that requires a rescue of, by banks involving an injection of 3.65 billion of new capital show that risk management failed. So it, it turns out that it, it is not easy to answer these questions. So defi to define a risk management failure, one must first define the role of risk management. So here they say, in a typical firm, the role of risk management is first to assess the risks faced by the firm, communicate this, these risks to those who make risk-taking decisions for the firm, and finally, manage and monitor risks to make sure that the firm only bears the risk its management and board of directors want what want it to bear. So when you look at the, uh, the role of the risk uh, of risk management, you as the risk man as the risk manager, your job is to first be able to identify the risks that the, uh, that the entity or the enterprise is facing, communicate those risks to those parties, then you say, okay, fine, this is how much risk we're going to be facing. And if we go this particular direction, this is how much risk we're going to be taking. And if we go in this particular direction, this is how much risk we're going to be taking. So we're going to be presenting those outcomes now to what? To the, uh, to the uh, management and board, to the board as well. Then the management and the board are the ones who have the responsibility to now decide exactly how much risk they are going to be taking, depending on the uh, risk appetite that they want the find want the organization to be finding themselves in as well. And we're going to be looking at this in more detail when we look at study unit nine. So please take note of this when you look at the role of what? Risk management. Then if you skip the next two, uh, three uh, sentences there, they also say, because firms are generally more concerned about unexpected losses, a frequently used risk measure is value at risk 
over a measure of downside risk. So valued risk is the maximum loss at a given confidence level over a given period of time. Please put your microphones on mute. Please put your microphones on mute. So please ensure that you always keep your, or put your microphones on mute as well so that we are, there's no interference when I'm uh, presenting. So, so we see that when you look at the case study of uh, uh, LTCM, they were used, so how they were uh, making a lot of money is that they were making a lot of money through the use of arbitrage. And how they were looking at, look, looking at the use of arbitrage is where they were saying that when you look at arbitrage opportunities, this is where you're basically saying that um, as a trader, you are seeing that there's a mispricing between a security uh, of a security in different markets as well. Like for example, as a typical example, let's say for example, you see that um, a calculator, uh, an HB, HP10B2 in Jobek is going for uh, 900 and then HB10B2 in Pretoria is going for 1,100, right? So when you look at arbitrage profit, this is basically where you're saying, okay, fine. You go into a simultaneous transaction to buy the HB10B2 in Jobek for 900 rent. And simultaneously, you're going into another, you're also going into a transaction where you're saying that you're going to be selling an HP, HP10B2 in Pretoria for 1,100. So which means what are you going to do? You're just going to get this uh, calculator here and sell it there, right? Which means that you are basically making uh, what, what, you, what is deemed to be what risk-free profit as well. So that's basically more or less the type of transactions that LTC MOSFAT was basically doing and how they would see and identify these arbitrage opportunities. They, they were using complex uh, mathematical um, models and they were also as one of the and one of the models that we're also using to as a measure of risk as well is basically what the what is what the value at risk as well. So here they say if you check on the on page four, they say this measure might be est, uh, might be estimated daily or over longer periods of time as well. So this measure well, might be um, um, are estimated daily or over a longer period of time. So in summary, they say, we see that here, they say, using the valued risk, they had worked out that 99% of the time, they would earn an average return of about 25%. And um, so it, to explain it in, in simple terms, it basically means that over a 99 year period, that, they would, uh, that the return and, uh, and the one year loss is in excess of what? Of 20%. So which means that over a 99 year period, they were expecting that over a 99 period, they would expect to be earning what? A 25% return. Then over that particular 99, uh, over that particular period as well, it basically means that uh, in a 100 year period, 99 years of the times they were expecting, according to their models, to earn a return of what? An average return of about 25%. Then, one year out of the 100 years, that's when they're expecting that maybe they might end up sort, suffering a loss in excess of what? Of 20%. So that's basically what their model was basically indicating to them. And because of this, many other um, uh, banks and financial institutions were willing to give them loans because based on their model, the chances of them suffering a loss was very minimal. So many banks were willing them to give them loans, knowing with, uh, because mainly uh, when it comes to the banks, they were willing them to give them loans because uh, giving them loans mainly because they could see that from the historical performance they were able to what to achieve that as well. And because of this, many banks were willing to give them loans. So you will see that because many institutions were willing to give them loans, it basically means that they were having a situation where their company was becoming more highly leveraged. So over time, they were becoming highly leveraged as well, because remember, it was easy for them to be able to get loans and what, and operate as well. So, all 
On the next page, so on the next page, uh, which is on page um, page five, here they say uh, on the second paragraph, deciding whether to take a known risk is not a decision for risk ma uh, for risk managers. The decision depends on the risk appetite of an institution. However, defining the risk appetite is a decision uh, uh, is a decision for the board and top management. So that decision is at the heart of the firm's strategy and of how it creates value for its shareholders. So remember, we're saying whenever you are going through uh, risk financing, always go back to the goal of the firm, just like what you've learned when you're doing your undergrad. What is the goal of the firm? The goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth, right? So the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth. Now, in, in the pursuit of maximizing shareholders' wealth, what do we also know? We also know that uh, the principle in financial management where we say high risk, high expected return. So which means the more risk you're taking as an organization, the higher the expected return, not the actual return, but the expected return. So now we know that the higher risk you're taking, it also means that you might end up what having a higher return, or you might also have, end up having what a higher amount of what of losses as well. So which basically means that that balance now is based on the decision that is made by the what by the board and top management. So those are the ones that are going to be who has the responsibility now to decide to say, okay, okay fine. In our pursuit of maximizing shareholders' wealth, how do we balance off between risk and, and return? So which means, based on this, it basically means that we also know that the more leverage an organization has, the higher the risk. When we're talking about leverage, were looking at debt. Remember, in the case of LTCM, they were because many banks were willing to give them loans, and because they were confident on their uh, models that they were using, they were willing to take those loans, and they're becoming what highly leveraged, which means that they are, the the percentage of debt over the overall uh, uh, financing of the organization was basically high. Remember, when you look at the percentage of debt. This is what we are saying: our assets is equal to equity plus liabilities. So when you look at this accounting equation, we're saying to finance the assets of the business, are we financing with equity of the firm or are we financing with debt? So which also means the more debt we are utilizing to finance the assets of the business, the higher the leverage. So the more debt we're utilizing to finance the assets of the business, the higher the leverage, which means that in this case, the higher the financial risk that the organization is going to be facing as well. So which means, uh, which means in this case, we also know that when you look at the financing between equity and liabilities, debt is usually the cheaper source of financing than equity. And if you look at the case of LTCM as well, it was very cheap mainly because because of the confidence and the historical track record of LTCM as well, banks were even willing to give LTCM uh, loans at a very, uh, at, a, what, at a discounted rate as well, which means that the interest that was being charged there was very, was lower than compared to other peers of, uh, uh, of LTCM as well, which was, because remember LTCM was what? Was hedge fund. So which means that because of this, what do we see? Leveraging increased because they were getting cheaper loans. But what we also know when leverage increases, risk also, also increases. And the risk here is the risk of the borrower of failing to repay the loans or uh, failing to repay the principal amount or failing to pay back what? The interest as well. So we have a situation now when you look at the case of uh, LTCM, we have a situation where you find that um, they were now highly leveraged, right? Because banks were, were confident that based on these models and based on their secret trade record, they were able to meet their obligations as well. So because they were able to meet their obligations, 
they were getting a lot more loans, but as they were getting more loans there, risk was increasing. Now the risk here is the risk that they might not be able to service their interest or they not, might not be able to pay back the principal amount when it falls due. But at the same time, having debt is not necessarily a bad thing. Because in this case, when the market was doing well, when, when everything was going well as well, they were able to meet their obligations. And at the same time, because they were financing their company or the firm with a cheaper source of financing, what do we know? It means their weighted average cost of capital was low, isn't it? And we also know that when you look at the relationship between the weighted average cost of capital and the value of the firm, we know that the lower the cost of capital, the higher the firm value. So the lower the cost of capital, the higher the, the firm value. So which means that in this case, because they were able to um, get debt financing at a lower cost, it means that they were able to maximize the returns or profitability in the short run. And in the long run, they were able to maximize what? The value of the firm. So that's why you see that the share price was increasing exponentially as well. But what do we know? It also means that the more debt you are also getting, the higher the chance that if there's going to be any uh, externalities that affect the performance of the organizer or, or the, the, that, that comes into the market, it basically means that you are now in a situation where they, if there's any disturbance because of high leverage, you are going to be left with a situation where you might not be able to generate that much of chance and you might not be able to meet the principal payments when they fall due, or you might not be able to what to pay the interest when it falls due as well. If what if there's anything that happens, what that affects or negatively affects what the profitability of the organization. So the main thing that you need to make sure that you take note from here is this relationship where we are saying the that uh, the. When it comes to um, deciding whether to take known risk is not a decision for the risk managers. The decision depends on the risk appetite of the institution. So however, defining the risk appetite is a decision for the board and top management. So the decision is at the heart of the firm strategy and of how it creates value for its shareholders. So based on this, if you check on the next uh, paragraph, on line number five of the next paragraph, they say, they also give us the go back to the uh, case study where they say, uh, for instance, uh, having to scale back its investment because of being financially constrained, having to sell assets in unfavorable markets, lose value of valuable employees who become concerned for their bonuses, uh, lose customers who are concerned about the institution being distracted or not having sufficient resources to help them, and face increased scrutiny from regulators. So, which means when an organization suffers huge losses, these are the consequences now that they can end up facing. Because all these stakeholders that are now going to be uh, having a concern on their uh, future, uh, or, 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 on, on, the, on their future uh, relationship with, what? with the organization as well. So when a company or an organization suffers huge losses, it basically means that these are the resulting consequences of what? of those losses as well, which basically means that they end up negatively what? affecting the organization. So looking at the case study, if you go to the next page, so now because of the, um, in, uh, of, uh, uh, the instability in the market, they had not anticipated uh, failures in their models because of the changing market, market conditions as well. So because of this, they tell us that by, um, at the end of 1997, LTCM had capital of 7.4 billion, but decided to return roughly 36% of the capital of its investors. With less capital, LTCM could still execute the same trades. However, no, now to implement them, it, it had to borrow more and hence had to increase its leverage. So by increasing its leverage, it could boost the return of its shareholders if things went well at the expense of making more losses if things went poorly. So, so it, was in, what it was increasing uh, was increasing leverage a poor risk management decision. So that's basically another question that you have to look at as well. So we, need, we know that when it comes to increasing leverage, it is an exponential effect of increasing what? The returns, and you can also increase what? 
the losses as well. So that's basically the problem that you have when you look at your increasing the leverage. And when you look at the leverage of the firm, you're basically looking at debt financing. So here they say, so looking at the case study of uh, LTCM, we see that they ended up suffering huge losses and the company had to be declared bankrupt mainly because of the losses that they suffered because their models basically failed as well. And one of the causes of their models is basically was because of the uh, change in market conditions because of um, uh, some market failures as well. And one of the other reasons was because the value at risk model that they were using uh, was basically based on the, uh, was, is, was more suitable for banks, but not necessarily for hedge funds. So because of this, uh, because of these miscalculations and errors in judgment as well, this resulted in what in LTCM suffering huge losses, which end up resulting in what um, the company being declared what bankrupt as well. So here they say, in summary, risk management does not prevent losses. So with good risk management, large losses can occur when those making the risk taking decisions conclude that taking large well understood risk creates what? Value for their organization. So take note of this point as well, where we are saying risk management does not prevent losses. But at least when you suffer the losses, those who have taken the decision, they'll be understanding exactly and anticipating that if we take this amount of risk as well, we know that we can expect a higher return, but we have a higher expected return, but at the same time, we can also expect what? Higher potential losses as well. So that's basically the idea behind the case study. So from the case study, I would not expect you to know the details and the intricacies of what was really happening from uh, when you look at the timeline or anything like that. The main thing that you need to do, that you need to take note from this particular case study is what is the role of risk management? Who makes risk management, uh, the, who makes the decision to own the, when it comes to what? The risk taking, uh, when it comes to risk taking of the enterprise as well. And what is the role of the risk management, of the risk manager after the board and the top management have decided to say, okay, fine, based on our pursuit of maximizing returns, this is how much risk we're prepared to take so that we're able to, what, to maximize shareholders' work. Then from there, it basically means that the risk manager now has to do what? The monitoring and reviewing of the risk-taking uh, activities of what? Of the different departments within a particular organization. So you will see that in study unit two, they are all, well, there's the main emphasis that they're also going to go put forth in, in study unit two is that risk management historically was seen as a separate entity of or separate um, as a separate department of the organization. But we know that going to the future for the organization to be agile enough to respond to the ever-changing conditions, the, in the, the ever-changing market conditions, it means that the risk management department has to work hand in hand with the different departments of the organization as well. So which means that based on that, it basically means that this is where we look at the cases of what enterprise risk management, which we are going to be looking at later on in the chapter. I think it's going to be study unit two. So now looking at this, we now look at uh, the concepts that we need to make sure that we take note of from unit 1.5. So, are there any questions? Are there any questions? So, when I you look at the people, yes? I see you're talking about articles. Where do we get these articles? All right. Um, those students who inquired regarding getting the trial package and those students who had um, registered, they were able to get these articles as well. Where did you register? Not yet. Okay, so just please make sure that you either register for the trial package or you register for 
uh, you do the normal registration because for you to be able to get these articles, because you need these articles when you're going through the different uh, the different study units as well. So please at least get one of the two so that you're able to access this material for you to be able to use it uh, in preparation for the classes as well. Okay. All right. Because if you are registered or you did, you registered for the trial package as well, you will see that they we give you a link to the Google Drive, and on the Google Drive you are able to get all these different articles for the different subunits as well. So they are there, and it's quite a lot of uh, it's quite a long list of articles that you're expected to go through. So please make sure that you get one of the two, or just talk to me after the classes, then I can be able to link you as well. All right. Are there any other questions? Yes, uh, there is a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to ask, where do we register to get these articles? Uh, because it's my first time to attend this this uh, class, so I'm still new. I don't know uh, what's All right. If you've been communicating with us via WhatsApp? Yes, I, I've been. All right, just communicate uh, with us so that you will say you you send us your email address. Then when you send us your email address, we'll be able to uh, send you the registration form. Then you complete the registration as well. Okay, thanks. All right, because what we do is the normal procedure would be you send us your registration form. We put you on our system. Then immediately when you send back the registration form, even before you make the payment, we are able to give you access to the material as well. So it's not like we're expecting to make the payment then we can give you access even immediately after we give you uh you send back the registration form we're immediately able to give you the access so that you have the material that you need to prepare for the next coming class as well so Hello. please yes i'm sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. um i registered with you guys i sent mm -hmm. the registration form i keep on yes. saying that uh, i cannot get the material and I even said that I'm going to pay the fees this month. And so I don't understand because I've registered. I asked for material. I'm not getting it. I'm not even getting a link. Are you able to, to log in? I'm able to log in because you guys are sending the Zoom uh, ID and everything. But no, I don't no, know. No, not for the online classes. Uh, on, I, the, uh, on the website. Because usually when you register, we send you an email. And on the email, it gives you instructions to say, this is a username. And this is your temporary password, and this is the link that you need to click so that you're able to uh, to access okay. the course. Okay, I will check my emails because I know the email that I I received it had uh -huh. a, a statement and a registration, uh, not even registration amount, the amount for the full courses that I've registered for, but there wasn't anything like there are email. two. There are two emails. Usually, there are two emails that we send you. One okay. email. They are, uh, just check on your emails that you received. There are two emails that we always send you at the same time. One email has your invoice just to confirm how much you are, how much is going to be your fee for the full year. The mm -hmm. other email, usually the first email that you receive before you receive the invoice email is the one that is confirming your, it says user RM Institute um, user activation. Okay, the, what I'm going to do after to after this lesson, I'm going to send you a, a message if because I'm going to check my emails. Please check your if emails. You should be able to receive that email, email with the heading user activation. And on that email, it confirms your email address, it confirms your username, it confirms your email, uh, your pass, your temporary password. Then it also gives you the link to say, click on this link for you to be able to what to access your material as well. Okay. Yes, Please check I your emails. I have, I have received um, that email, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to log in. But mm -hmm. exactly where do we get the information from? The Once, the once you're logged in, if you click, once you're logged in, right? If you click on courses, you will see that the course that you're doing is going to reflect there. Yes, they do reflect. And RISK 4803. Then when you click on RISK 4803, if you scroll down, Remember, you get the videos. Then if you keep scrolling down, you will see that there's a link which says uh, RISK 403 articles. And if you click on that link, it takes you to the Google to the Google Drive. Mm, OK, yes, I can see. All right. OK, all right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
Yes, um, I have a question. This is on the material itself. Um, there was somewhere where you spoke about the inverse relationship between capital and, um, and the firm. I'm, I'm not sure maybe if you can reiterate that part. I, I was missing it there. You mean this relationship between capital and the firm? Yes, yes. Okay, so the assets of the business is basically gives you or indicates to you the firm value. So whenever you want to find the firm value, you need to find out exactly what is the market value of the assets of the business. So which means from the accounting equation, your assets is equal to equity plus liabilities. So which means this side is where you find the capital. Is that the question? Oh, you are looking at, okay, let me give it to you as a diagram. Uh, for those who did um, undergrad in Tunisia, where, where the, you did your financial management, they, if you still remember this diagram, which shows you the firm value, uh, the cost of capital, and the cost of capital. And then it shows you the amount of debt as well. So in general, we're basically saying, we know that when you look at the cost of capital, we look at the weighted average cost of capital, right? And we say, generally, we expect that your weighted average cost of capital is basically that cost, the, the weighted cost of equity and the weighted cost of what? Of debt financing, right? So we know that normally, the more debt financing are utilizing because it's the cheaper source of financing, the lower the cost of, uh, the weighted average cost of capital. But it goes down up to a certain optimum level. Then beyond this level, what is happening? The, now, when you keep borrowing too much money, it means your investors are now going to say, this person is too risky. Imagine someone who's borrowing from party A, borrows from B. Now, when they're going to be borrowing from C, C is going to say, ah, you're already owing too many people. So which means that it's now becoming too risky because the people that you're owing is too much. So what is going to happen? Over time, it's over. As the debt is increasing, we expect the weighted average cost of capital starts uh, increasing after a certain optimum point. So we see that we're saying when you look at the firm value, the relationship is also something like this, where we are saying, um, okay, this is the optimum level. The relationship is something like this, which shows you the firm value. So to maximize shareholders' wealth, what do you do? It means you want to find yourself where you are able to maximize the value of the firm, right? So how do you maximize the value of the firm? By making sure that you try to minimize the what? cost of capital. So which means where the point where the cost of capital is at its lowest is the point where your firm value is expected to be what? At its highest. So this is basically what LTCM was trying to do, where they were trying to have a situation where they knew that the more debt financing they get, up to a certain optimum level, they were able to, what? to minimize their cost of capital. That's why you see that if you look at the case study as well, they ended up even what? Um, uh, the company ended up what? Repurchasing some of their shares because they ended up having less equity because they knew that they could get more financing through what? Debt financing. What they were trying to do is to find themselves in a situation where they're able to win, minimize their cost of capital because they're utilizing the cheaper source of financing with this, which is debt. But at the same time, they knew that the lower the cost of capital, the more they're able to maximize the value of the firm. Was that the question? Are we together? Are there any questions? Morning, my leader. <clears throat> Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, right. Can you please just check the chat box or the chats? So I think some people also have posted something on the chats. Yes, 
So the articles, you are able to get them on uh, on my UNISA. There is a way of you be, to be able to get them either on the library or under materials. So just check there. They say you're able to get them. But on our side, we already have what? We've gathered these articles over the years. So if you are struggling to get them on my UNISA, you should be able to get them uh, from us as well. We're willing to share those articles with you. I think most of the questions there was to do with uh, articles, I think. Are there any other questions? Uh, my, uh, my, my leadership. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether it's 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 me on this side because yeah. I can hear you loud and clear when you're presenting, but uh, in terms of seeing the screen, uh, the diagrams that you're talking about, I can't see them. Hi, how are you? Are you referring to the board? I'm referring to the screen uh, that you are presenting. I can't see anything, oh, but you I mean can. Oh, when I'm sharing things via Zoom. Yes, correct. Uh, I'm not sure what would be the problem, because I also usually I have a secondary I device think... that I usually. Can we? <clears throat> can we? Can we assist? Can we assist? Can we try to see if we can assist him? I just give a second, my dear. Uh, just so go my to Rhinos, Just go to Rhinos name and pin on him and you will see when he share everything go to rhino's name oh and yeah click after that if you... mm. so at the same another thing is that if he, if he can look at the bottom of his device there are many thoughts on that device he must just scroll through all those thoughts up until he sees your screen because definitely you'll find it that's the simplest thing. yeah so usually if you check on your device uh, if you check on your device, there is this, uh, there's uh, squares which show the different participants on the class as well. If you click, uh, if you check on the one that says Renos Mosha, and you check on the top right hand corner, if you highlight on the top right hand corner, so you see that there's a blue uh, button that appears with three dots on it. And if you click on it and you say pin, it would mean even when other people are participating, you will still be able to see whatever I'm sharing as well. So yeah, the, the settings, they changed a bit. I remember last year. So because of this, it means that for you to be able to continuously see what I'm sharing, then whether it's on the board or uh, it's going to be on, 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 on the uh, PDFs that I'm going, to be going through, uh, just click, if you check on where it says Renos Musha, one of the participants there, on the top right-hand corner, and if you click on it, you see, and, and you click on a pin, it would mean that no matter what happens, you are still able to continuously see what I'm sharing as well. Okay. I'll are there so. any other questions? <clears throat> are there any other questions? Someone asked uh, a question about being able to hear. Uh, sorry, Rhinos. Yes. So, I want to check. I haven't registered yet with you. I want to check uh, the cost doing this for oh, four eight zero three alone. All right, uh, can you chat with me on WhatsApp? Then I'll give you the link for you to be able to get that information as well. Oh, okay. The WhatsApp that has been created. Uh, direct message, preferably. Oh, okay, can I get your number? All right, just check with the guy who's running the admin on the WhatsApp group okay. there. You'll be able to. Right. Uh, you'll be able to get the information. All right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Are there any other questions? All right. So remember, what we have done so far. There are 
two main things that you need to make sure that you take note of. So from what we've done so far, So from what you've done so far, most of the material that we've looked at on the case study, it's not something that I would say is examinable, but there are two main principles that you needed to take note of from, those, um, from that material. The first thing is the different roles of these parties when it comes to uh, the issues of risk uh, taking of the organization. What is the role of the risk manager? And what is the role of the top management and, and the board as well? So please, you need to be able to understand this because going into the future, when we're going to be looking at the issues of risk as well, uh, uh, risk taking of the organization, you need to understand the roles of, of these part different participants. The intricate details of what happens to LTCM, yes, we went through it, but it's not important. It's not something that I would say, prepare for the exam or take note of for the exam, no. It's not important. The main thing that you need to take note of there is what are the different roles of these different participants that you find in an organization. That's the most important thing. The rest of the information, we went through it for it to make sense to you, but it's not something that I would say is highly examinable. So please make sure that you take note of that. The reason why I'm giving you this information is mainly because our risk financing, RSK 403, there is a lot of articles that we're going to be going through. There's quite a lot of them mainly because there's no prescribed textbook. So the lecturer, um, uh, the lecturer com uh, compiled articles that he, uh, he knew that we needed for us to be able to understand and make sense of the different uh, outcomes that we're supposed to take note of from those articles as well. So you will see that, yes, you can get your articles from my UNISA, but remember those ones, they are, the reason why I would say try as much as possible to get the articles that we share with you is mainly because they are already highlighted with a bit of notes on them. So you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you are going through and eating a lot of material from the article where some of the material, you don't necessarily need to know the material. You don't necessarily need to know it because you will see that some of the article, they go so much in depth when it comes to understanding the statistical side of how a particular model, they came up with a particular model. But remember, as a risk manager, you don't need to worry about knowing exactly how did they come up with a particular model. You need to know more about what, how to use that particular model and what are, the, uh, what are the factors involved in what that affects the applicability of the model. They, how they came up with the model, you don't need to worry about it as well. So you'll see that, Yes, you can get the articles from my UNISA. Yes, you can do that, but try as much as possible to use to get the articles that we have because they're already highlighted with a bit of notes on them. So it helps you uh, limit, uh, limit and streamline the uh, amount of material that you're having got to go through and remember as well because it's quite a lot of articles that you need to go through. So it's better for you to now know the final version of uh, the articles than consuming a lot of material because you end up getting confused and doing things, the most important thing is that we don't want you to go through things that we see that they are not necessarily going to be useful for you going to the exam. There's no point in doing that. Yes, you can now know about the breakdown of a particular model, how it, but you're really wasting time because it's a lot of material that you need to make sure that you go through. Why? Because you don't have a textbook. If it's a textbook, it's more straightforward on exactly knowing what you need to consume, what don't you need to consume. But in, when it comes to articles, you need to be very cautious. And if you're going through the articles by yourself, please make sure that you always have this study guide handy with you. So go through the articles based on what the study guide is saying you should go through and based on what the self-assessment uh, is expected, or, or under what self-assessment, what are you expected to know from those particular articles as well? So that it helps you streamline and so that you only know and take note of the information that you need for you to be able able to pass the exam is going to the exam. So looking at one, uh, unit 1 1.5, uh, we now look at, um, we now look at uh, the typology of risk management failures. And on line number five, they say, two types of mistakes can be made in measuring risk. Known risks can be mismeasured and some risks can be ignored either because they are unknown or 
viewed as non-material. So once risk is, uh, risks are measured, they have to be communicated to the firm's leadership. So a failure in communicating risk to management is a risk management failure as well. So because remember, you, you want to make sure that whoever is making that risk management decision to say, this is how much risk we're prepared to take. Whoever is making that decision, they need to be well informed on exactly what risks are they going to be taking and what are the consequences of what taking that risk as well. So after management decides what kind of risk to take, risk management has to make sure uh, that the firm takes these risks. So in other words, risk managers must then manage the firm's risks, a task that may involve identifying appropriate risk mitigate, uh, mitigating actions, hedging some risks, and rejecting some proposed trades or projects. So do you see that if you look at the actions of, um, if you look at the, some of the case studies that we looked at, like for example, if you look at the case study of uh, Bearings Bank, you had a situation where Nick Leeson was, was basically just taking risk on his own. There was no oversight. There was, there was basically no review. And he was basically acting on as both the front office and the back office, which basically means that there was very little room for, it, for accountability. And because of this, it basically meant that he was able to now take on so much risk than what the organization was, what was willing to take. Why? Because the management was now put in a situation where they were willing to turn a blind eye because he was making a lot of money for the organization. He was making hundreds of millions in uh, British pounds of, of profits for the bank. And he, at one year, he was, uh, he was actually able to, to get a bonus of about 10 million pounds, mainly because of what? Because of his trades. So because of this, because he was making a lot of money for the bank, they're willing to, what? to, 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 uh, to turn a blind eye on his activities as well. So because of this, what do we see? It basically means that you have a situation where the individual, if they are not going to be monitored by the risk management department, they are going to have a situation where, the, let's say, for example, the bank is saying, we want to make sure that the maximum risk we're prepared to take is probably um, uh, just above conservative, depending on the, uh, the risk rating scale that they, that they use as well. Then you see that Nick Listen is going all the way up to being aggressive as well. So what do you see? It basically means that you have a situation where there's no accountability, mainly because the risk management department is not really necessarily playing its part. And in most cases, you find a situation where organizations, that are under, the management of the organization, they're under a lot of pressure to perform or to produce a lot of profits for the shareholders because they want to maximize shareholders' wealth. But at the same time, you they are now willing to turn a blind eye on a party who's making a lot of profits for them because they are they are comfortable. They are also earning a lot of what? Uh, compensation and bonuses as well. But at the expense of what? The organization going over and above what the risk, uh, what the risk the organization should be, what should be taking as well. So here they say, with this perspective, there are six types of risk management failures. So please take note of this. Remember, this has not been examined before. So it's something that you need to make sure that you take note of so that if it's going to be coming in the exam going to the future, then we know that we are covered. Although it's not something that we've seen previously when you look at past papers and assignments as well. So the first one is where they say, mismeasurement of known risks. Then the second one, they say, uh, failure to take risk risks into account. And the third one is failure in communicating the risks to top management. Uh, fourth one, failure to monitor the risks. And the fifth one is failure in managing the risks. And sixth one is failure to use appropriate risk metrics. So when you now look at these types of uh, risk management failures, looking at the first one, when you look at mismeasurement of known risks, now we are going to be based on looking back on uh, based on what um, LTCM as well. So here they say. So looking at this, uh, on line number four, they say risk managers could make a mistake in assessing the probability of a large loss 
or the size of a large loss if it occurs. However, in addition, they could use the wrong distribution altogether. So they could use the wrong distribution altogether. So here they say, a simple way to put, uh, a simple way to put this is that correlations may be mismeasured. So correlations are extremely important in risk management because the benefit of diversification falls in correlations and what is correlations increase as well. So when you look at mismeasurement of non risks, we're basically saying that you are looking at this situation where you are using the, long, the wrong distribution. So which means when you're Wait, using the wrong, wrong, yes? Just take a question before you move on. Um, mm -hmm. Just to understand, on failure in managing the risk, I wanted to understand, uh, are we referring to risk managers or managers? Because my understanding on that uh, fact is that you do have other legislative that says uh, the role of managing the risk lies with the, the risk owners. And then as risk managers, we are there to coordinate and monitor that a risk in terms of um, its materialization and to ensure that if ever there are emerging risks, we are able to advise managers. So I wanted to understand in which sense now here we are referring to failure in managing the risk. We are referring that's, to managers or risk. That's point number five. Eh? I'll explain it in yes. detail when we come to point number five, because now remember we're going back, we're now looking at this uh, risk, fa risk management failures uh, one by one as well. And we are still on point number five, so I'll explain it in detail and I'll also highlight your question as well when we get to point number five as well. Okay, no, thanks. All right, so on the first, remember they say, uh, if you check here, they say the first one would be mismeasurement, mismeasurement of non-risks, right? So we're going back to now to all these risk management failures and looking at them in detail as well. So the first one that they give us, when you look at mismanagement of non-risks, this is basically where you look at what? The use of the wrong, uh, distribution altogether. Like for example, when you are um, using the binomial distribution, uh, instead of using the normal distribution or any of those what assumptions as well. Then they also look at the issue of, uh, um, is, uh, when you look at the correlation, there's yet say, a simple way to put this is that correlations may be mismeasured as well. And if you mismeasure correlation, you are able, you are failing to now account to see exactly how much risk are you taking? Because when you look at correlation, you are looking at a situation where we say your correlation coefficient varies between minus one and plus one. So this is where you find your correlation coefficient. And when you look at this, we know that when it's plus one, this is where you say, uh, when it's somewhere here in this particular direction, this is where you say your correlation coefficient is what? Positive, positively correlated. And this region is where we say the correlation between two variables is negatively correlated. And when you look at, at zero, this is where we say there is no linear correlation. So when you look at correlation coefficient, when we say it's positively correlated, let's say for example, we are looking at two securities, M and N. When we say they are positively correlated, we are saying, for example, uh, when you look at the relation between the returns over time, we are saying when the return of security M goes up, if they are positively correlated, we're also expecting the return of security N to go up as well. And when the return of security M goes down, um, so they're basically moving in the same direction. So when security M goes up, security N goes down, goes up. And when this one goes down, this one goes, goes down as well. So this is what we say they are positively correlated. Then if they are negatively correlated, we look at a situation where you look at, for example, the return over time of the two securities, the return over time of the two securities, we are saying they're negatively correlated. 
So we say M is moving in this direction. If they're negatively correlated, it means they are moving in this opposite direction. When one is going up, the other one is going down. And one is going down, the other one is going up. So they're basically moving in the opposite direction where when M is uh, increasing its value, so N is going down and N starts going up, M is going down. So they're basically moving in opposite direction. So this is where we say they're negatively correlated. So now, what do we see? We know that when you look at the issue of correlation, when ideally you want to be invested in securities with a correlation coefficient, which is closest to minus one. Because when the securities are at minus one, this is where we say they are fully diversified. You are fully diversified because you're basically saying that you are having a situation where over, overall your security, your returns are going to be expected to be falling somewhere within this region. So the overall effect on your portfolio, you're expecting your overall performance to fall within this particular region. But now the problem with securities which are positively correlated, what do we see? When they both go down, it means in a particular period of time, you're expecting to suffer losses. And when they both go up in a period of time, they're expecting what to suffer gain. So which means that that upward and downward swings because they're moving in the second di the same direction, it basically means that your risk is very high. So your risk is high here and your risk is very low there as well. So ideally you want to be investing in a portfolio where the correlation coefficient is closest to minus one as much as possible. So which means if you don't do the, or if you do the wrong calculation to determine the correlation coefficient, you are going to have a situation where you are going to mismeasure the known risk because you're going to think that you're taking so much risk when in actual fact, you're not taking that amount of risk as well. Like for example, you can say, uh, you can do the measurement of your correlation coefficient and you see that your correlation coefficient is minus, uh, minus 0.7. When in alpha effect, your correlation coefficient is plus 0 0.7. So what does that mean? It basically means that you are you think your risk level is here, when in alpha effect, your risk level is there. So which means this is where what, what we mean when you look at what mismeasurement of known risks. Are we on the same page when it comes to the uh, the first point? Any questions? So here they say, so here they say, with the LTCM example, it could be, it could be that the true probability of a loss of 70% was higher than 1%, uh, than 1%, say 25%. So which means that they are basically saying here, we thought that um, we thought that the, the risk, the, when you look at the case, uh, the case study of LTCM, they thought that for them to be able to suffer a loss of 25%, they thought that it was, uh, the, for them to be able to suffer a loss of 25%, the probability of them uh, suffering that loss was, uh, they thought it was 1%, when in actual fact was what uh, was, was basically higher than 1%. In this case, was probably what 70%. So, which means that if you mismeasure the probability of you suffering a loss, it basically means that you are going to end up having a situation where you are taking on more risk than you realize that what you're actually taking on as well. And this is one of the reasons why you see that LTCM ended up what ended up collapsing as well. On the next page, on paragraph number three, they also say, when an institution has many positions or projects, the risk of the institution depends on how the risk of the different positions or projects are related. So if the correlation between the positions or projects is high, it is more likely that all of the firm's activities perform poorly at the same time, which leads to a higher probability of a large loss. So these correlations can be difficult to assess and, and they change over time at times what? 
abruptly as well. So this is basically what we're trying to explain when you looked at the what when you looked at the uh, the uh, the uh, the line between uh, when you look at the measurement of what correlation uh, uh, correlation co coefficient there. So which means the more the correlation coefficient is going towards one as uh, the positive one, the more the higher the risk that you're going to be what that you're going to be taking as well. So here the same. So in this case, risk managers could not be expected to know that what correlations will be, but their assessment of the risk of a portfolio or of the firm would depend on their, esti on their estimates of the distribution of the correlations. So in this case, it would be possible for realized correlations to be different from their expected value, and yet there would be no risk management failure. Then if you skip the next paragraph, they also say historical data is at times of little use because a known risk has not manifested itself in the past. So for instance, with the subprime crisis, there was no historical data of a downturn, downturn in the real estate market during which a large amount of securitized subprime mortgages was, was outstanding. So in such a situation, risk management cannot be done by simply using historical data, since there is, uh, there is a risk of a decrease in risk asset prices that has not manifested itself in a comparable historical period. So they're also saying that, remember we said that risk managers, they're basically going to be using the models that they have available to be able to, to estimate how much risk they're taking as well. So sometimes the other problem that, uh, that they also encounter is that sometimes there is no historical data that is available for them to be able to use. Like for example, in the looking at the case where we look at um, the 2007, 2008 uh, financial crisis as well, it was mainly be, be because of what, uh, 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 because what was coming from that, uh, the subprime um, mortgages as well. And you, and historically, there was uh, the, um, the, uh, the fall in the subprime, uh, the, the subprime crisis, had not manifested itself previously. What when you look at the historical uh, crisis that had happened in the financial the financial crisis that happened historically as well? Because just before that was around two thousand and one, when there was the dot com crisis, and before that there was the Asian market crisis. I can't remember what they call it as well. So which means that even if you look at historically as well, there was no data available for them to be able to now measure to say. So what happens if you're highly leveraged in the uh, subprime mortgage space? What is going to be so? How much actual risk are you going to be taking? So because of this, because there's no historical data data available, it will be very difficult now to have a, a good estimate of exactly how much risk taking you are basically going to be uh, taking as well. How much risk you are going to be taking? So here they say there is a fundamental problem with the performance of risk measurement when assessments become subjective. Suppose that all parties agree that an established statistical model works well, right? So which means, here they say, as risk management moves away from established quantitative models, it becomes easily embroiled in intra-firm politics. So at that point, the outcome of the firm depends more, much more on the firm's risk appetite and on its culture than its what risk management models. So here they're saying, so there are some cases where they, uh, they establish models that they basically agree to use. You are having a situation where the other departments are basically saying that they're telling you that, uh, so you have a situation where, in addition, then a risk manager established and questions the reliability of a statistical model used by experts in the field concerned. So which means, remember we said, as a risk manager, you use the models that you have available for you to be able to utilize as well. So some of the issues that you might have a problem in is where you are told by experts in a particular field that these are the models that you're going to be using. But as you're using these models, you start having a problem or such thing, uh, some, um, some uh, question marks on those particular models that you're basically using now. So you, you, you are trying to avoid a situation where you are bogged up in, polit uh, in company politics where you're arguing about the liability of a problem when uh, in the world out there, the market is constantly what? Evolving. So you don't have a situation you are, so you're now caught up in a situation where you are checking on the reliability of the measurements of the risk that is going to be a uh, measurement of the risk based on the model that you are uh, recommended to use. But at the same time, the market is constantly changing, which means that you are bogged up in what 
uh, on the, in, uh, arguing about the liability of a model than actually what uh, measuring the risk so that you're able to what, keep up with the continuous what changes in what market conditions as well. So that's another issue that you also uh, that also arises where there's what me, that results in what mismeasurement of what of uh, known risks as well. So are there any questions regarding uh, the first risk management failure? Are there any questions regarding the first risk management failure? All right, can we take a few minutes break until 9.45? So can you take a few minutes break until 9.45? Then at 9.45, we are going to be looking at the second, uh, the second point. So, can we take a few minutes break until nine forty-five? Then, at nine forty-five, we are going to be looking at the, uh, the, the second type of risk management failure. So, can you take a few minutes break until nine forty-five? Then, at nine forty-five, we look at the uh, second type of risk management failure.
All right. Um, on the next point, on the next point, we are now looking at um, a failure to take risk into account. Uh, we're looking at a failure to take risk into account. And under that, we look at um, mismeasurements due to ignored risks. So mismeasurement due to ignored risks. And under that section, so here they say, ignored risk, uh, ignored risks can take three different forms that have different implications for a firm. First, a firm may ignore a risk even though that risk is known. And second, somebody in the firm knows about the risk, but that risk is not captured by the risk models. And third, there is a realization of a truly unknown risk as well. So which means on the first point, they look at ignored known risks and the other thing, a good example of this possibility is as follows. Before the Russian default, uh, the Russia uh, defaulted on its domestic debt in August 1998, many hedge funds took positions where they thought high yielding Russian debt hedged by the debt against the default risk and finally hedged that debt against exchange risk. So it was easy to believe that the resulting position had no risk. However, to hedge the current risk, the funds had to sell rubles forward against what? Against the dollars as well. So that you know that whatever position that, that you would have invested in uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Russia, when you're now, when you're now looking at liquidating the, your position back to US dollars there, you'd be, you would have already what, covered your position by entering into what? Into a, uh, a long forward contract as well. So which means that because they didn't uh, enter into a short forward contract, so which means that because LTCM had not taken that particular position, it basically meant that even though they had not taken the, into account the risk that they might be a, 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 an issue when it comes to the exchange risk there, it basically meant that they ended up suffering losses when they were now trying to liquidate their position, which were, uh, which were in rubles going back what? to the US dollar as well. So that's basically where you look at, if you look at the case of LTCM, this is where they ignored Non risks, which means that they ignored the non risks with the idea that eventually they would be able to sell their position without necessarily being what that affected by the movements in exchanges as well. Then they look at mistakes in an information collection. So the next point would be mistakes in information collection, where they say. If some risks are not accounted for when risk is measured for a firm, the risks left out are not adequately monitored and they, are be they become large because organizations have a tendency to expand unmonitored risks. For instance, consider a trader whose risks are only partly monitored. Typically, traders have a compensation formula that involves an option uh, payoff they receive a significant share of the profits they generate, but they do not have to give back the losses. So if only some of the risks of a trader are monitored, he can increase his expected compensation by increasing the risks that are not monitored without suffering any of the consequences. So which means that when you look at mistakes in information collection, this is where you, you identify that the risk that the trader is going to be taking, then you are now going to say, based on the risk that we have identified, this is how much risk we are prepared for you to be able to take. And we are going to be monitoring this set of risks as well. So now we have a situation where there are those risks that you've identified and you're going to be monitoring. Then there are those risks which are also existing, but they, they, there is no information available for you to be able to use or put in your model for that you're going to be using, but to monitor the trader as well. So what the monitor, the trader would now do is that for them, we know that the higher the risk, the higher the expected return. So what do they do? Within the risks uh, that, they've been, that have been identified and that are being monitored, they stay within the bounds. 
but those risks which I have not been, which are not being monitored, they now have a situation where they invest most of their most of their trades in the risks which are not being what monitored. So which means that overall, their risk taking is now way up. But at the same time, based on what is being monitored, the moni the organization is saying that you are within the bounds. But overall, they are way over the bounds, and they know that even if they go off way over the bounds, they know that if the risks pay off. It means that they are going to be they are they are going to be the returns are going to be high, and at the same time they are going to be compensating what a higher bonus as well. But if the risk if, if they if there is going to be a higher losses as well, what is going to happen? The the company is the one that is going to be suffering, or the investors the one that is going to be suffering. But at the same time, the trader themselves are not going to be what the ones taking what a hit for the losses as well. So that's basically where you look at what mistakes in information collection so that's another issue then they also they also say accounting for all the risks in risk measurement is a difficult and costly task however not performing that task for an organization means that the firm's top executives are managing the company with blinders on they see only part of the big picture they have to understand to manage effectively so which means that because they are only monitoring part of the risk, not the, the overall risk that they, they are basically going to be exposed to as well. It basically means that the company or the top management is only going to be making decisions on part of the overall risk of what? Of the organization. So the organization is faced with so much risk, but they're only taking on um, making decisions based on what? Part of the overall risk of the organization, which basically means that they are not making a decision based on what? On uh, all the information that they've got having available as well. Then we also look at unknown risks. And here they say, other unknown risks may not matter simply because they have a trivial, they have a trivially low probability. So there is some probability that a building will be hit by an asteroid, but that risk does not affect any management decisions. So ignoring that risk has no implication for risk management. So here they say, because of this, they have to conclude that they do not capture all the, uh, all the risk in their models, and therefore some capital has to be made available to cope with unknown risks as well. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Now, remember, the third risk management failure looked at failure in communicating the risks to top management. So the third risk management type of risk management failure was failure to communicate the risk to top management. So when you look at that failure, this is where we look at um, communication failures. And the other thing, risk management is not an activity undertaken by risk managers for risk managers. Rather, it is an activity undertaken to enable the firm to maximize shareholder value by taking optimal decisions across the firm. So if you skip the next sentence, they say, therefore, risk management is to provide timely information to the board and top management that enables them to make decisions concerning the firm's risks and to factor the firm's risk in their decisions. So in, in order for the board and the top management to under, understand the risk situation of the firm, the situation, the situation has to be communicated to them in a way that they can understand properly. So this is basically where you look at what failures in communicating uh, the risk as well. So when you look at failures in communicating the risk, this is where you are now having to, so which means that one of the ways that you can uh, avoid the issues of failure in communicating the risk is where we are saying that as a risk manager, when you're presenting the risk that you've identified to the top management as well, you need to be able to avoid the use of what? Technical jargon. Because if you start using technical jargon, mainly because uh, some of the parties in the um, 
who are going to be making decisions when it comes to risk management, they, they might not fully understand the technicalities or the technical terms which are going to be utilized, and which means that we are going to be using too much technical jargon. We are having a situation where the party who's supposed to be making the decision, they are going to be making the decision by not, but at the same time, not fully understanding exactly what are the implications of the risk that they're going to be taking as well. The next one looks at, is combining point number four and point number five, where we look at failures in monitoring and managing the risks. I think this is where one, someone was asking questions there as well. So here they say, risk management is responsible for making sure that the firm takes the risk that it wants to take and not others. So as a result, risk managers must constantly monitor the risk that the firm is taking and further, they have to hedge and mitigate known risks to meet the objectives of the top management. So when you look at managing risk, this is basically where we are saying that they have to do what? Do the hedging and what? Mitigating the known risk to meet what? Objectives of the top management. When you're looking at hedging the risk, this is where you can look at, look at what? The use of, for example, derivatives to what? To mitigate the risk of what? Of, of the organization. Like, for example, when you can look at the use of the derivatives, this is where we are now going to be saying, in as part of our risk management, or as, as part of managing the risk, we are now going to be using, for example, uh, either forward entering into a forward contract, entering into a futures contract, entering into an options contract, or entering into a swap transaction, where you are now going to be what? Uh, this is basically some of the tools available for you to be able to, what? to manage the risk of the organization as well. So here they say, for, for the typical non-financial firm, risks often change slowly. So not so for financial firms. For a financial firm, risks can change sharply even if the firm does not take new positions. So the problem arises from the fact that financial firms have many derivative positions and positions with embedded derivatives. So over time, these positions have become more and more complex as well. As we have seen, uh, when you look at the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis, where they were now packaging these um, uh, subprime mortgages as well, and uh, selling them to investors who didn't really understand these uh, particular, uh, uh, these new uh, instruments that were being sold in the market as well. So which means that over time, when you're now even looking at the use of derivatives as well, you have a situation where the trader might not fully understand the implications on the underlying asset when it comes to the derivatives as well. Because remember, when it comes to the derivatives, the value of a derivative is basically derived from what is happening to, what, to the underlying security as well. So which means that if you're not understanding exactly what are the risk factors affect, affecting the underlying security, it also means that you're not going to be able to fully comprehend the risk factors affecting what your derivative as well. So that's basically what they're looking at when, you, uh, when you're looking at what they fail and monitoring what and managing the risk as well. Then here they also say, when the risk characteristics of securities can change very rapidly, it is challenging for risk monitors to capture these changes and for risk managers to adjust hedge, hedges appropriately. So this challenge is especially great when risk characteristics are, are, can change dramatically for small changes in the determinants of security prices. So as a result, risk managers may fail to adequately measure risks or hedge risks simply because risk characteristics of securities change too quickly to enable the managers to assess these characteristics properly or to put on correct hedges as well. So they also go on to say, in large complex organizations, it is also possible for individuals to take risks that remain hidden for a while. So a trader might have constructed a complicated position that only he understands. So this position might be such that under such circumstances, it could lead to large losses. So the position might use the securities that are not incorporated in what risk management system of the organization. So because of this, it basically means that the risk management system of the organization might not be able to fully comprehend the risk implications of what of the positions taken as well. Then on the next paragraph, they also go on to say, the effectiveness of risk monitoring and control 
depends crucially on an institution's culture and incentives. So if risk is everybody's business in an organization, it is harder for uh, pockets to, uh, of risk to be left unobserved. So if employees' compensation is if affected by how they take risks, they will take more uh, risk more judiciously as well. So the best risk models in a firm with, uh, with poor culture and poor incentives will, uh, will be much less effective than of a firm that is an incentive of employees to are better aligned with what risk taking objectives of the of the firm. So here they are basically saying that you don't have a situation where the incentives of uh, employees' compensation are more on the returns than managing the risk. So they are basically saying that the incentives of the organization, uh, when it comes to the employees, must be more inclined with the risks that the employees are taking than not necessarily what the returns that they're generating there as well. Mainly because you don't want an organization to be left with the dilemma where the trader, for example, takes on so much risk and makes a lot of money for the organization. So now this trader has generated so much money for the organization. Now they're having a dilemma to say, so should we penalize this individual? Because if they penalize this individual, but uh, they are now having a situation where if we, if we penalize the individual, but the individual has made a lot of money for the organization, so we are disincentivizing them. But at the same time, you are you are also saying that this individual has gone over and above the risk limit. So ideally, you are basically saying that you must ensure that you have a risk culture where individuals are incentivized to stay within the risk limits. Because if they are going to be staying within within the risk limits, it basically means that. You, you are avoiding a situation where you end up penalizing an, um, an, an individual or a trader who has gone beyond the risk limit and end up what, making a lot of money for the organization. So, which means that you don't want to have a situation, that particular situation, mainly because you are now going to have this culture or a culture within the organization where traders can end up what uh, disregarding the risk limits of the organization as well. So, are we on the same page? when it comes to uh, risk monitoring and managing the risk as well for the organization. Are there any questions? I think there was a question uh, regarding managing the risk. Uh, are we answered or there's still uh, a question there? I think you, you, it was answered because my understanding now is when we refer to management of risk and we refer to risk managers, it's about the treatment that we need to apply in terms of managing that particular risk. Yes, yes. So you're looking at the treatment where you're now saying, so what methods are we going to uh, manage the risk so that we stay within the risk limits? So one way is through, for example, the use of what? Of derivatives as well. Because remember, the, the, if you don't enter into a derivative transaction, derivative transaction to manage your risk, for example, you are now having a situation where you are waiting to see exactly what is going to happen sometime in the future as well, right? But if you're now going to be utilizing the derivatives as well, it basically means that you're going to be end up in what? Reducing the risk of your position as well. Because if you use derivatives, you're having more certainty on exactly what the outcome is going to be. If you don't use derivatives, you have a lot of uncertainty on what the outcome is going to be. And because you don't have, you have a lot of uncertainty on what the outcome is going to be, it means the risk is also expected to be higher as well. Are we on the same page? Any questions? All right. On the next point, we look at risk measures and risk management failures. So we look at risk measures and risk management failures. And yet they say, so far, we have taken the risk metrics as given. We now show that Focusing on risk metrics that are too narrow may make it harder for management to achieve its objectives. So specifically, risks that management would consider important can be left unmeasured and ignored. So a widely used risk measure in financial institutions is, is a daily value at risk measure for trading activities. Now, focusing on the daily market value at risk Though intellectually satisfying for risk managers because the most, uh, most up-to-date quantitative techniques can be 
brought to bear on the problem can only be one part of the risk management and not the one that top management should focus on. So top management has to focus on the longer run implications of what? Of risk as well, because we need to find out exactly, so what is the long run implication of the risk? And in the long run, how much risk are we going to end up what finding? How much risk are we going to end up what finding ourselves in? Instead of just focusing on what? The daily uh, risk measurement methods as well. So which means that you have to look at the long run implications than what considering or being bogged down in what short term uh, implications when it comes to risk measurement as well. So here they say, the daily valid risk measure assumes that assets can be sold quickly or hedged so that a firm can limit its losses essentially within a day. However, both in 1998 and over the last year, we have seen, which is basically where we look at the 2008-2007 uh, the, uh, the financial crisis, we have seen that markets can be suddenly less liquid so that daily valued risk measures lose their meaning. So it is firm, so if a firm sits on a portfolio that cannot be traded, a daily valued risk measure is not a measure of the risk of the portfolio because the firm is stuck with the portfolio for a much longer period of time. So which means when you look at these daily risk measures, we have a situation where we know that normally when, we have, when the financial markets go through financial crisis, what the, one of the reasons why many uh, uh, parties end up having large losses is mainly because of the illiquidity in the market. It's not easy for you to now be able to liquidate your position. So because of this, it means that if you're going to be using the daily value at risk measure, but it's going to take a longer period of time to liquidate your position, it basically means that the daily um, risk measures are not going to be relevant for you because you are now having a situation where you are going to be, it's going to be taking you a longer period of time to liquidate your position. So which basically means that if you're looking at the daily risk measures, they, they are not going to be useful for you because your risk, your positions are not necessarily going to be, um, be able to be liquidated after a given trading day. Yeah, it's gonna be taking a longer period of time. So if it's gonna be taking a longer period of time, you now need to find out exactly. So what are the risk implications over a longer period of time? Not necessarily on a daily basis as well. Are we on the same page? So when it comes to Article for Unit 1.5. So when it comes to the Article for Unit 1.5, please take note of the roles of uh, the risk manager and the roles of the top management uh, of the top, top, manage, top management and the board of the organization as well. So please make sure that you take note of those two, the role of the risk manager and the role of the top management of the organization. To say, when it comes to risk, what is the role of the risk manager? And what is the role of what? The top management, because we need to be able to understand these different roles going to the future. The second thing that you need to make sure that you take note of there is basically the different types of risk management failures. So please make sure that you take note of the different types of risk management failures. Remember, we are given the case study of LTCM, but don't worry much about the intricacies of exactly what was happening with LTCM. The most important thing that you need to make sure that you take note of is those two things. The role of the uh, risk manager, the top management, and also the different types of risk management failures. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Unit 1.6, uh, moving on to unit 1.6, we look at what a difference a word makes. So we look at what a difference a word makes. And unit 1.6, they look at understanding the threats to performance in a VUCA world. So as I indicated previously, unit one and unit two, the main concern that we have there is very much relevant to what we see organizations experiencing currently, where we are saying that we are 
now living in a situation where because of the progression in technology and all those other things as well, we have a situation where the market conditions are changing more aggressively than what they used to be uh, historically as well. So, so because of this, we now need to find out exactly, so how are you as part of the top management of the organization going to ensure that your organization is able to keep up with these changes and the, manage the risks that come with all these changes in the market conditions, these rapid change in the market conditions, and how do you also ensure that you are not, not only going to be concerned with what mitigating the risk, but how do you also ensure that you're able to create a competitive advantage for the overall organization as well. So that's what we're going to be mostly worried with as well. So looking at this, Uh, for unit 1.6, they say we need to be able to explain the acronym VOCA and illustrate with examples from your own ex uh, enterprise, discuss complexity in the context of this article, and draw a comparison with the 7 billion write down in Woolworth Limited with their subsidiary in uh, Australia. But I don't, I'm not going to worry much about um, the, the case of uh, Woolworth Limited in Australia, mainly because you see that. Um, when it comes to the issue of the case studies, the lecturer will give you the case study itself, then ask you to uh, apply the knowledge that you have based on that particular case study as well. So we're not going to worry much about that. So, okay, so the main thing that we need to make sure that we take note of from unit 1.6 is exactly what is VUCA and uh, what is VUCA and what are the implications of uh, VUCA when it comes to the organization as well. So, Looking at unit 1.6. So unit 1.6 looks at what a difference a weight makes, understanding the threats to performance in a VUCA world. So when you look at living in a VUCA world, we're basically saying, if you look at historically, the type of organizations that are uh, we used to have, we had a situation where uh, if you look at the running a business in the 60s or 70s or before that as well, you had your own supermarket, you had your own supermarket that was selling uh, groceries, that are selling uh, whatever you were selling there, whatever goods you were selling. So you realize that Historically, when it comes to managing your risk, it was very much easier to manage your risk, mainly because there were not that many factors that were affecting the, uh, the running of your organization. But now, over time, because of globalization, what do we see? There is a lot of risk factors that are going to be taken into account, mainly because we're now living in a global community, which means that even when you look at the issue of competition itself, Historically, back in the olden days, we had a situation where the people or the competition that you were worrying about, whatever goods or services that you were offering, were basically the uh, competitors, which is other supermarkets that you could see within your surrounding as well. But now, because of globalization and the uh, progression in technology, we see that your competition can be anyone in your region, anyone in other countries. You can even be competing with another company in what? In, uh, in, in the US as well. And you see that even now the competition is becoming even more and more intense. Like for example, you hear that um, Amazon is trying to set up its operations in what? In, uh, in Cape Town, they're trying to set up their headquarters in Cape Town as well, which basically means that if they're trying to set up in Cape Town, it also means that takealot.com, uh, takealot as well, is going to be very much concerned with these uh, uh, progressions as well, mainly because, uh, you, Historically, someone would say, okay, fine, when I compare Amazon, take a lot, if I buy something on Amazon, it might take a bit of time to me, for me to be able to, to get these goods. But now, what do we see? Amazon is moving closer because they see, realize that there's a bigger market in South Africa, which basically means that take a lot now is now having, is now doing away or is now losing out that geographical advantage that they had because take a lot was basically based in South Africa as well. So, with, which means that with all this progression, you see in technology, you see that 
there is so many other factors that you have to take into account, which basically are affecting the competitive advantage of the organization. And also, we see that even when you look at the issue of the pandemic as well, initially started in, 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 the, in China, and within a few weeks, we were already affected by what? By, 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 by the COVID-19 uh, by, by COVID as well, right? So which means that because of this global community that we have, it was becoming, uh, the, 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 the issue of the pandemic is becoming something that even as organizations, you now have to continuously what? take into account which is gonna be affecting your operations as well. Because remember, how the reason why you are worried, worried about living in a VUCA world, I'll talk about the acronym soon. The reason why we're talking about our, our living in a worried about living in the VUCA world is mainly because we see that because we're in a global community, there are so many factors that you have to take into account as a risk manager, which ends up affecting the operations and profitability of the organization. Because remember, at the end of the day, the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' work. And how do you maximize shareholders' work? By make, making sure that you minimize your cost of capital. And if you minimize your cost of capital, you have to maximize your returns as well. And we also know when you take into account your cost of capital, the cost of capital, whether it's cost of equity or cost of debt, also takes into account the risk premium, which basically means that we need to find out exactly how do we also minimize the risk so that our cost of capital is what is at its lowest. And if our cost of capital is at its lowest, we're able to what? maximize the shareholders' work as well. So looking at the article, uh, on the first page of the article, on page one, uh, on the columns to the right, on line number seven, they say, of course, optimists see the edge of a company can gain if the leaders master their, uh, their company challenges. For example, when you look at the, the VUCA acronym, Volatility, uh, the V, so when you look at the VUCA acronym, So when you look at the VUCA acronym,
So when you look at the Booker acronym, we're basically saying the environment in which business organizations are operating in are basically affected by these different conditions, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity as well. So these are the conditions which are basically affecting the environment in which the different uh, organizations are going to are basically operating in as well. So based on this, we now need to find out exactly, so how do we ensure that we mitigate the effects of these uh, factors in ensuring that we're able to create what? Mitigate the, the, mitigate the effects of these factors and also at the same time, being able to create a competitive advantage what? For the organization as well. So based on this, if you check on the article, they say, uh, if you check on the article, they say, Volatility provides profit opportunity, but we'll discuss exactly what volatility is. Uncertainty is opportunity. And uh, we look at simplifying IT complexity is a major opportunity. And ambiguity equals opportunity. So do you see that they are basically saying that all these factors as an organization, you are trying to have a situation where you are able to create a competitive advantage in it despite these what factors which are going to be affecting the organization. So here they say, uh, before we go there, let's look at these factors which are given in table one. So let's look at these factors, uh, which is the VUCA uh, factors which are given in uh, table one. So in table one, they say, the first factor that they give us or they discuss here is volatility. And they say, what is or what it is relatively, unstable change, information is available, and the situation is understandable, but the change is frequent and sometimes unpredictable. So you have all the information, but you don't know exactly when things are going to change. So you don't know exactly when things are going to be changed, are going to be changing. So an example here, when it comes to the issue of volatility, is when we say commodity pricing is often quite volatile, Jet fuel costs, for instance, have been quite volatile in what? In the 21st century. So how to effectively address it when it comes to the issue of volatility? They're saying agility is key to coping with volatility. So resources should be aggressively directed towards building slack and creating the potential for future flexibility. So if the organization is not flexible enough to keep up with the changes, it basically means that you are, you are not going to be able to what? You are, you are not going to be able to create a competitive advantage and create an opportunity out of the conditions that are what are playing out in the market as well. So this is basically how you can be able to mitigate the effects of what volatility that you face in the market. Is there any question regarding volatility? Any questions? The next factor would be uncertainty. And yet the same. What it is, a lack of knowledge as to whether an event will have meaningful, meaningful ramifications, cause and effect are understood, but it is unknown if an event will create significant change. Uh, an example of this is where they say, anti-terrorism initiatives are generally pla plagued with uncertainty. We understand many causes of terrorism, but not exactly when and how they could spare attacks. Then to mitigate the effect of uncertainty, they say information is critical to reducing uncertainty. Firms should move beyond existing information sources to both gather new data and consider it what from new uh, and consider from what from new perspective. So when it comes to mitigating the effect of uncertainty, it basically means that firms need to be gathering more and more information. That's why you see that right now, over time, firms are spending more and more money in what? Research and development. Are we on the same page when it comes to the effects of our uncertainty? The next one is complexity. And here they say, many interconnected parts forming an elaborate network of information and procedures, often multiform, uh, multiform and convoluted but not necessarily involving 
change. So when you look at complexity, this is basically what we are saying that as due to the progression in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in the in in, uh, in, in, uh, in in the world because of globalization, we see that the more uh, uh, we are progressing towards globalization, the more complex it is to now manage the different risks which are going to be affecting what a particular organization as well. So here they say an example of this is where we're saying moving into foreign markets is frequently complex. Doing business in new countries often involves navigating a complex web of tariffs, laws, regulations, and logistics issues. So how to effectively uh, mitigate the effects of what complexity? They say restructuring internal company operations to match the external complexity is the most effective and efficient way to address it. So firms should attempt to match their own operations and processes to mirror environmental complexities. So it basically means as the organization is growing, you must also ensure that there are clearly defined different roles and departments within the organization. And they also know exactly what their responsibilities are within a particular organization. And this is how you're able to mitigate what the issue of complexity. Like for example, when you're starting off your organization, probably you have a situation where the same person can be running marketing, can be running um, manufacturing, can be doing a lot of things as well. So we, which basically means that the more the organization is growing, for you to be able to keep up with complexity, you cannot expect the same person to be doing running all these different departments as well. So ideally, you can now have different people running these departments so that they're able to keep up with the changes in what within uh, those departments as well. Then the next one is ambiguity, where they say a lack of knowledge as to the basic rules of the game, cause and effect are not understood and there is no precedent for making predictions as to what to expect. So the transition from print to digital media has been very ambiguous. Companies are still learning how customers will access and experience data and entertainment given new technologies as well. So which means that when you look at the issue of ambiguity, we're basically saying that the, it's very difficult to predict, to predict exactly the cause and effect of what of the changes that you're going to be uh, experiencing as well. So which basically means that you need to make sure, so which means that you have a situation where you are having a dilemma where you are you don't know exactly how the change in consumer taste is going to be given the change in what, for example, technology as well. So here they say, to remedy this, they say, experimentation is necessary for reducing ambiguity. So only through intelligent experimentation can firm leaders determine what strategies are and are not beneficial in situations where former rules of business no longer apply. That's why you see that in most cases, when a company is trying to introduce a new product, they do those market research where they give customers samples or they even collect a, a group of uh, customers may they give them a sample and then they hear exactly what their feedback would be as well. So that's basically one way that they're going to be able to deal with what ambiguity. And the reason why they want to be able to deal with ambiguity is mainly because they want to make sure that they are still be able to provide the relevant goods or service to the customer because of the changes in the market conditions. Because if they are not able to do that, what is going to happen? They are going to be end up being outdated. Like for example, they look at the change of technology in comes to entertainment, where now you see that the companies that you, the, the companies that used to offer uh what is that? Those ones that used to offer video cassettes and uh DVDs, they've now been outdated. Now people are watching uh movies and series or what on Netflix as well. So which means that companies need to be able to keep up with this high level of what ambiguity that you face due to the effects of globalization and changes in progression technology as well. So is there any question regarding these acronyms before we look at what the article say about these acronyms? Any questions? So in case, remember historically, we've never seen a question based on uh article for unit 1.6 it has never come before but in case it does come you need to be able to identify what uh, uh what do these acronyms mean 
what are they? And also, how do you mitigate the effects of what of these factors as well? So going back to our article, they say three significant problems exist in how leaders have employed these terms. First, their use has been uh, cavalier. VUCA has become a cute trend way of saying unpredictable changes. And yet they say, though the words do have related, uh, related meanings, it uh, is the difference among them that are most valuable for leaders to understand. And secondly, second, even when pundits and leaders are sensitive to the differences in meaning, there is a lack of information regarding just what, uh, what is it that leaders should do in order to confront one or another of these conditions as well. And finally, finally and likely because there is a depth of uh, actionable advice out there, too many leaders are confronting this VUCA world by simply throwing up their hands, which basically means that in this case, we're saying they simply give up on what, give into these conditions instead of finding out exactly how can we be able to create a competitive advantage for that, for the uh, firm as these conditions, what materialize as well. So here they say, consider these three problems and it uh, consider these three problems and it is evident that the second and the third are not unavoidable consequences of the modern business world, but rather entirely avoidable outcomes of the first. So on the next paragraph, they say, in the paragraphs that follow, we begin by pointing out the difference between the terms volatility, uncertainty, and complexity and ambiguity. Then we discuss how to identify VUCA situations in the organizational environment and distinguish exactly what type of unpredictability is being experienced. And finally, we discuss the ways leaders need to position their companies to address their singularity. Each requires um, something different from the company and its leadership as well. So looking at the acronyms, when you look at vo uh, volatility, they say a volatile situation can be defined as one that is unstable or unpredictable. It does not necessarily involve complex structure a critical lack of knowledge or, a doubt, uh, 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 or about the what outcomes may result from these key events as well. So which means when you look at a situation which is volatile, we're basically saying, you know something is coming, but don't know how quickly and the magnitude of it, which what it will happen as well. So here the thing, the secret to dealing with volat volatility is with any component of VUCA, is understanding the opportunities and threats inherent in what in the situation as well. So here they say, when volatile changes is ex uh, change is expected, the best way to prepare is to devote resources towards developing agility. So which means in this case, the key to agility is reliable forecasting because if you're able to reliably forecast what's going to happen in the future, it basically means that you are going to be able to now prepare yourself for the for those what for those uh, outcomes when they play out as well. Then the next acronym is uncertainty. And yet they say uncertainty is uh, is a term used to describe a situation characterized by a lack of knowledge, not as to cause an effect, but rather pertaining to whether a certain event is significant enough to constitute a meaningful cause. So uncertainty is not volatility. A volatile situation is one in which the change is likely, but the, that change may come quickly or at what varying magnitude. An uncertain situation, on the other hand, is, is not so volatile. In fact, there may be no change. Uh, uh, there may be no change inherent in it at all. So which means in this case, the same, because uncertainty exists, in the lack of adequate information, addressing it is simply in, uh, simply involves obtaining information. So investment here entails methods of collecting, interpret interpreting, and sharing information. So uncertainty can be solved structurally by devoting more resources to boundary spanning activities, moving beyond existing networks, data sources and, ana and analysis processes to gather information from new partners and look at different 
uh, looking looking at it differently. So information networks are created for from many different sources, both inside and outside the firm. So this principle is well illustrated by, by the aftermath of what of the 2001 terror attacks. To gain reinforced uh, distinct, um, uh, distinction between the different components of VUCA, we note that the post 9-11 situation was not necessarily volatile. The core issue facing the world's government was not a lack of stability and predictability. Rather, government leaders realized that the success of the attacks of the World Trade Center might encourage other terrorists to create similar plots as well. The next letter looks at complexity. And here they say, a complex situation is characterized by many interconnected parts. Again, this is distinct from a volatile or uncertain situation. And if you go to the columns to the right, they say, instead, the most straightforward way for an organization to address complexity is to simplify the situation by adopting a structure that mirrors that of the environment. So research has consistently shown organizations that adapt themselves to match environmental change perform to substantively higher levels, whereas firms that are maintain past structures and processes in the face of changing business environment are less effective. So in the, in the most obvious example, as a small in for our informal organization grows, it is expected that the formal departments will appear to address what has become too much for a single person to handle. So finance, operations, marketing, and human resources functions are established so that each part of the organization addresses something in which it has what expertise as well. So here they say, uh, when in Reed's situation, they give us that example. They say his firm's growth into uh, into so many new markets creates a complexity that might best be solved by moving to a more geographically based organization structure, such that different branches of the company are able to specialize in understanding and exploiting market regulations and idiosyncrasies as well. So that's basically how you are able to deal with the issue of. Um, uh, complexity. Then when you look at ambiguity, they say ambiguity characterizes situations where there is doubt about the nature of the cause and effect relationship. So just a lack of understanding, understanding as to what will happen next. So, and that lack of understanding is distinct from the uncertainty. In a merely uncertain situation, we have a good idea of what causes what. In an ambiguous situation, on the other hand, typical typically revolves around a wholly new product, market, innovation, and opportunity. So an ambiguous situation is more challenging because of the newness. There is little historical precedent for determining the outcome of certain causes and course of action as well. Like for example, if you're going to be going into uh, producing a new product or you're going to go into uh, going into a particular new industry as well. So it basically means that this is where you are going to be looking at the situation where you are facing a lot of what? Ambiguity. So in the case of ambiguity, we believe the key to success is experimentation, not lack, uh, not slack resources, information gathering, or restructurization as well. So here they say, so this is how, so do you see that all these factors are basically uh, summarized and discussed in table one. So please make sure that you're able to take note to see exactly what are the what are the acronyms, what are they, and also how do you mitigate the effect of what of all these acronyms as well. So under final thoughts, which is basically in conclusion, they say globalization has created opportunities with one hand on with uh, one hand as it has introduce threats with the other. So the stubborn global uh, recession is blunted repeated bests of optimism for the return to a path of prosperity. So layer on the challenge uh, of digesting technological advancements that impact industry, as well as the co consequences of demographic 
shifts in the workforce and there and there can be little doubt that leaders have their hands full. So which means that at the end of the day, we're basically saying that, yes, uh, in the environment in which the organization is uh, operating, we're being faced with uh, volatility, we're being faced with uncertainty, we're being faced with growing complexity in the environment, and also we're being faced with a lot of ambiguity because what is the organization is growing, we're going to be entering into what uncharted territories as well. So because of this, we were basically saying that because of globalization, we, you as a business leader, you need to find out exactly how do you mitigate these uh, effects? And also at the same time, how are you able to uh, create a competitive advantage for your organization is what is we are going to be facing, what all these different conditions that we're going to be experiencing in the market as well. So that's the whole idea behind the acronym VOCAL. Is there any questions? Is there any questions regarding the acronym? Any questions? So when it comes to unit 1.6, please make sure that you take note of table one. So you need to understand exactly what does each letter represent and what is it? And also, how do you mitigate the effects of all these different conditions as well? So take note of this, because although this has not been brought into the previous um, questions, uh, uh, previous assignments and past exam papers as well, if, we, if, if it ever comes, my suspicion would be they give you a case study you know, or a small case study. And based on that case study, you now need to uh, be able to identify so where, where, how do you, or what are the different factors? Like for example, how do you identify the uh, issue of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity? And for if, or, or for all these factors that you've identified, how are you able to now mitigate those effects as well? So that you're able to what? To create a competitive advantage for your organization. So typically, if they ever, if ever it comes in the exam, that's how ideally you would be expected to address um, such, uh, uh, conditions as well and uh, mitigate their effects. Remember, start unit one, when you look at it historically in assignments and uh, past papers, uh, I don't remember there being questions that have been asked based on study unit one, but if it ever comes, please take note of these um, things that I've emphasized on from unit 1.5 and unit 1.6. Please make sure that you take note of them. Very, very important. Are there any questions? All right. So in the next class, in the next class, we are going to be looking at study unit two. So in the next class, we're going to be looking at study unit two, which looks at enterprise risk management. So now, when you look at enterprise risk management, we're basically saying, how does the risk management function relate with the different functions of the organization? So we're basically looking to say, how does the risk management function relate with the, uh, the different functions of the organization? The reason why we are very much concerned with this is mainly because we're basically saying that we know, we have now seen that we're living in an environment where the market conditions are changing, there's a lot of changes that are expected to happen in the market. So how do we ensure that the organization is agile enough to mitigate the effects of these continuous changes in the market so that we're able what, to create a competitive advantage for the firm? Because if we're able to create a competitive advantage, what does that mean? It also translates into what? Maximizing shareholders' wealth. So whatever activity we do, as part of the as part of our risk management department, always remember that the end goal is to ensure that we are able to maximize the shareholders' wealth. And for us to be able to maximize the shareholders' wealth, how are we able to now create a competitive advantage for the firm in the sight of what all these what are continuous, continuously changing market conditions? Like for example, what I've given you previously, where we said if you look at it now. We're going through a pandemic. How are we able to create a market uh, a competitive advantage? Uh, so based on this, we now need to find out exactly how we're able to what 
create a competitive advantage based on by making sure that how do we understand the relationship between the risk management department and the other functions of the organization as well. Are there any questions? All right, if there are no questions, enjoy the rest of your day. Please, for the, uh, if you're not able to access the articles for the next class, please communicate with us so that we're able to give you the links and the information that you need for you to be able to access the article so that you already what have the articles before the next class as well. And Just my advice would be, my advice would be what as well, please try as much as possible to either register for the for the module or try to get the, because uh, I think study unit three, two, we are still have, uh, have information available for the trial package as well. So please try as much as possible to be able to, what, to access so that you are able to get the videos from last year and use those videos to prepare for the next coming class as well. So that in the next coming class, if there's still something you don't understand, you will be able to what, ask questions and we can be able to actually what, give you more details as well. Are there any questions? Sorry, before you leave, mm -hmm. I just wanted to find out, are we still gonna get those classes or it as time goes by, it's only those that have registered are gonna get their classes? Uh, remember, after the period, after the period where we give free classes, you will need to be able to register to access the other classes as well. Uh, okay. And secondly, yeah. when we, we, we were responding to, to one of the questions that was raised regarding, which we mentioned something about it too, I think it's better for you to get the, the, the package, you're talking about the package, two types of packages. Can you please maybe, because if this is for my first uh, time in the classes. Can you so, check? Can you check with that mean for you to be able to get the clear uh, uh, the clear um, answer to that? Can you just check on WhatsApp? Remember the, uh, all the groups that you belong to, there is the, you should be able to communicate with the admin and get the what the, the information on how to access the packages. So just check, communicate with the admin on, on, on the groups that you are on to be able to get the packages as well on how you are able to get the packages. Okay, thanks. All right. All right. Um, if there are no questions, enjoy the rest. Uh, the rest of your weekend. Uh, sorry, uh, for... sorry, my leader. Sorry, my leader. Yes. It's just mm -hmm. before you leave. You've mentioned that uh, the cutoff mm -hmm. of the free classes is uh, we like after the cutoff of the free classes, we'll start having classes for the ones who only registered. So, is there any mm -hmm. indication by when is this the last one or is the upcoming one the last session? For free class because they are there were two free classes that were scheduled one class was done uh the the, pre, uh, the two weeks ago and this is the second free class that was scheduled as well so please so, uh -huh. based on that based on that which means today is the last day for the free class yeah 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 okay thanks all right please communicate with your admin you'll be able to get more clearer information there as well please communicate with the admin i would emphasize this All right, enjoy your weekend.